I'm going to talk about two approaches for this problem. The first one, which is, to be honest, this is what I did when I did the question, is to try some different values of x and see if you can just, you know, rule some of them out and see which the answer is. Like, you know, when, when you're under time pressure, I think it's the one that jumps to mind. And then I'll talk about a more sophistic sophisticated way of actually, you know, if you weren't given the graph, how could you actually plot this thing? It's obviously a lot more involved, but, you know, useful to see. So, First up, we've got y equals sine of inverse cos of x. Now, the, the a point that jumps to mind for me is x equals 0. Because if we can work out what's going on, we can rule out some of the graphs very quickly. So that would be y equals sine of inverse cos of 0. So actually, what that is asking, what that is asking us is what angle gives us zero essentially and it's this one here it's 90 degrees i'm working in degrees here so it would be sine of 90. yeah and i could write some of these things down like cos 90 is zero um sine of zero is zero these these look like they might be useful but anyway sine sine 90 is then actually equal to one because this is what the graph looks like Okay, so I've actually worked out a coordinate, 0, 1. And therefore, I can immediately rule out B, rule out D, and I can rule out E. Okay, that's great. So now I've got to think, um, how would I make this thing equal to 0 itself? It's going to be sine of something um, is 0. And actually, if I can do sine y equals uh, sine of 0, then I would get 0. So I'm thinking cos of what gives 0? And that's going to be when x is equal to cos 0 or 1. Okay, so when x is 1, I've kind of like, I've kind of worked my way backwards here, but if x is 1, I'm going to get y equals sine, I'm just writing out in full now, of cos to the minus 1 of 1, which is actually sine of 0, which is 0. Um, now, actually, that doesn't help because both of these hit the axis there. So I've just got to maybe think, what else, what happens when it, okay, but I've gone with 1, right, let's try minus 1. That looks like it's going to be the other side. So then I'm going to get y is equal to sine cos to the minus 1 of minus 1. Now what value of cos gives me minus 1? And that is going to be my 180. So cos 180 is minus 1. So it's sine of 180, but that is also 0. So I've just put these values in, and actually it's got to be C as my answer, because this one was positive, whereas this one is 0. So Hey, I've worked it out, and uh, that is one way of doing this question. Um, just a little bit more info, like I, I purposely didn't do this because I was thinking maybe you haven't, you know, you might not have covered this yet, but, you know, one thing you could do in this question is draw the graph of cos x. This is y equals cos x. And then actually think about the inverse of cos x, what it actually looks like. This is technically a second year topic, though, in A-level maths because I'm, I am going to talk about it, but only quite quickly. But this does not have an inverse as it stands. What we have to do is restrict the domain so it is a one-to-one -one function, because otherwise you get two possible values when you find the inverse, which is not allowed. Functions have to be one-to-one. -one. You put in one value of x and you get one value of y. But now I've restricted it from 0 to 180, if I'm using degrees, then I see I've got a few coordinates. I've got 0 and 1. And what that means when I do my inverse is I get a coordinate of 1, 0. So I know my graph is going to look like that, 1, 0. Um, because that's what the inverse does. It swaps it around. I'm sorry, I know I'm talking about this quite quickly now. Uh, and then I get 90 and then 0, which gives me 0 and 90. Again, I'm working in degrees. And finally, I get 180, uh, comma, minus 1, which will give me minus 1, 180. And inverse cos actually ends up looking like 
that. And that, that could assist you with this question because you can see that if you put in um, if you put in one, you're going to get inverse inverse cos of one is zero, which is gives you sine zero, and therefore you get zero. If you put in zero uh, inverse cos of uh, zero, you get ninety, and if you put inverse cos of minus one, you get one hundred and eighty. So it's a little bit quicker than what I did here, and uh, I hope maybe it it clarifies um, what I've done basically. Right, now I'm not finished because we're properly now going to work out how we could deal with this equation. Because it looks pretty horrible. Y equals sine inverse cos of x. But there is actually a really nice thing you can do. And it, it does come into year two um, and yeah, mainly year two A level. But it is worth knowing how to relate sine and cos in this way. And there's an identity that says that sine squared a plus cos squared a is always 1. So that's not an equation, it's an identity. It's always 1 for any value of a. And this, what we can do actually is rearrange it. So um, hold on, not in terms of sine though. So no, in terms of sine, sorry. So sine squared a is then 1 minus cos squared a and therefore sine a is the square root of 1 minus cos squared a, technically plus or minus. Um, so here we can apply that and we're going to get y equals, and I can replace my sine by plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cos squared of cos to the minus 1 x. So that is okay to do. I've just replaced sine by its equivalent form, the square root plus or minus the square root of 1 minus cos squared a. Now there is something I need to raise and I'm going to talk about it right now rather than leave it to the end. Now um, it's going to refer back to the inverse cos. So inverse cos is actually always positive um, and it's going to be between 0 and 180. But when I put that into my sine function, sine is actually always positive between 0 and 180. So although I get a plus and minus technically when I take the square root here, when I put in my values, I'm only going to get the positives. So I'm going to get rid of it here. And um, yeah, well, that, that it's fine in the identity, but I would, I'm would i not going to get any negatives for my actual graph for, for the reasons I've given. And we're nearly there now, because remember, this is, I find cos of the bracket first, and then I square it. So actually, here, I cos of inverse cos of x is just x, because they're, they're inverses, I just get back to the original. So I'm going to get x, and then I'm going to square it. So I've managed to turn this function for being a trig function into y equals the square root of 1 minus x squared, just the positive versions. Now, if you square both sides, you get y squared equals 1 minus x squared. And if you rearrange it, you get x squared plus y squared equals 1. Remembering, however, that y is always going to be greater or equal to 0. And what this gives us is a circle centered at the origin, but only the top half. And that is why it precisely looks like this. And that is how you would do this. Like if you weren't given multiple choice and you're asked to sketch this function, which would be, you know, pretty, pretty hard, um, but could be, you know, could be done, then that is how you would achieve it. And you can do similar with, you know, other sorts of functions involving sine and inverse cos. Just try, try and rearrange it. Um, there's a topic called parametric equations where you do that sort of thing in second year A-level maths. So yeah, thanks for watching to the very end. I've tried to clarify exactly why it looks like it does. I've talked about a variety of different methods, trying some points out, actually going deeper and looking at the inverse and like explaining why exactly you know these points work, and then going for full-on identities, um, substituting in, and getting the equation of a circle, albeit a top half.